Alright, hello friends and welcome again to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast where we bring someone else's local meta to you where today we're diving into North Carolina into the Triangle. We've got our regularly scheduled hosts. I am Jay Fay. Hey, 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 it's Travis. And I'm Strong Plays, uh, also known as George. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All the way from North Carolina, huh? I assume there's no smoke problems down in North Carolina compared to New York right now? Uh, I mean, in comparison, it's hard to say that we have a problem, but we did have a warning today specifically. Yeah. Wow. It's a little hazy out in New York right now, actually. Yeah, it's been pretty smoky over here in Minnesota, too. God, I wish those Canadians could just get their their stuff together, man. Right? <laughs> yeah, I mean... You know, this, you know, our air quality is probably like everyone's feeling about the current meta, right? Okay, yeah, yeah that's a pretty yeah, strong yeah. segue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a hot take. It's probably too hot because, you know, we're going to turn the temperature down post post data slate, right? We've we got our big change that yeah, everyone was big, waiting yeah, for. Big, big change. Uh huh. Are there is there quotes in that? You know, I did, for what it's worth, I did try a test game with cults. Um, uh, funnily enough, I used my Tau as my cults, so I had my Pathfinders as the devotees, and then they turned into crisis suits when they transformed into torments, which was That's fun. That's awesome. That's great. Um, but I, I did notice the Icon Arc damage mitigation. So, you know, it might not feel like a lot, but it does hurt their durability somewhat, which is not nothing. <laughs> Yeah, I played a game uh, with cults after the thing, and I would have had two more models uh, if the Icon Arc damage reduction was a thing still. So it's not nothing. Yeah. I mean, you know, on In the Dark, I doubt that the one damage mitigation nerf on the Icon Arc is really going to shift all that much because on In the Dark, cults are able to move over the board so safely. But on Open, where, you know, not all the terrain is going to be heavy... It does help. I do, I do think it it will help. And on open, I don't think cults are nearly as busted. And goats for the same matter. They're just not as strong as they are in the dark, where those two teams probably just are going to make it melee summer for the next three months. Yeah, yeah. As it turns out, when you have a melee team and you can't just not get shot, it's probably something to do with the balance that GW expects the game to have. I don't know. Weird, weird concept, though. Yeah, I mean, at least for the data slate changes, there were a slew of other changes that I think are positive changes for the community, right? We've got the new loot changes. So those two point swings in the first three turns are no longer going to be the whole game. I'm sure that you both have run into this issue before. So that's a positive change. I like it. I don't know how you two feel. I, I actually disagree. I've never had a problem with loot. Um, and I think moving them to four victory points per thing disincentivizes uh the the sort of dynamic play that having three per objective wants people to play because in in previous in order to guarantee a win on loot you needed to go and take an objective from your opponent you had to commit resources to do that otherwise it was going to be a stalemate in if you can just score your objectives the, for the entire game now you just it incentivizes playing for the secondaries rather than playing for the primaries. See that yeah. perspective. Yeah, I get that makes sense. Um, you know, I don't know. I couldn't help but think I wanted the the 16 victory points for loot too and seeing that, you know, is a welcome change for me. Yeah, I, another one of my my locals put it as um loot was an outlier in tournament data. So if you had a bad loot game, that could keep you from getting into the top or even uh, if there wasn't enough rounds to get an uncontested uh, you know, winner, it could keep you from winning a tournament if you got a harder loot than someone else did. And so I think that having 16 points on loot is great for tournaments, but it makes the individual game less exciting. See that. I do I... think that like overall it could make the horde teams on open a little bit campier because now you don't like now you can have both the backline guys and the GA2 dudes run up. So that could be maybe problematic. We'll see how it plays out. I've got a tournament coming up this weekend. Uh, that'll be done by the time everybody hears this, but I'm interested to see how players react to those changes. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think it's a change. I'm hesitant to say it's a bad change. Personally, I don't think it makes the loot a 
good mission to play, but I don't think it makes it much worse than it was before. So, yeah, great. Yeah, speaking of, you know, things that have changed on the data slate, do you have any players in your local area that are excited to play any of the newly changed teams? Like, what is the North Carolina meta looking like? Um, Man, we have a really diverse meta here, actually. Um, There are... There is really kind of everything. You know, we got Kazakin, we got Vetguard, we got all flavors of um, elite teams. We got a couple of Warp Coven players. Um, really the only melee players tends to be me because I'm an asshole and I like getting up in people's face. <laughs> so like, I'm the only guy playing Gowerpox or cults or, uh, goats. The villain. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm a villain. As one of my, my guys said, he hates playing me because I'm just so like fun to play against. And I'm such a nice guy that even when I'm kicking their ass, they're still having a good time. And he hates that. I mean, that's part of the fun parts about playing a board game, right? Is if yeah, you're a, a nice person, everybody gets to have fun versus, you know, maybe a more competitive game online where, you know, fun is a finite, finite sum. Yeah, I, I think that everyone should be having fun playing the game that they like. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, so I'm curious before we go further into that, like how how does your local scene look like? Do you have like weekly events? Um, you got tournaments, you've got a league, um, like roughly how many people? Just give us a quick rundown on that. Oh yeah, so we run. Um, I have a um, I have a partner who does quarterly leagues. We were doing eight week leagues, um, with like sixteen players or something. Now we're doing ten week leagues with twenty four players um, signed up, uh, and I think we had a waiting list for the last one. And then I run quarterly tournaments in the Triangle area. Um, and so I've done, uh, you know, three, I did, uh, an open tournament and into the dark tournament. And the next one I'm doing on September 30th is going to be a doubles tournament with both. Fun. Are you, I assume the format is going to be like a split pairing. So there's an open and an in the dark board. Yeah, it'll be, uh, like a Nova team thing, but only two instead of three. And so it'll have its own little, uh, pairing mini game with team captains and stuff. I'd probably uh, say that I had a lot of success adding a little bit of spice into the format so that you could borrow CP from your allies to make it a little bit more interactive. So Yeah, I'm still toying with that idea. A lot of the locals really like that um, as a concept, so it's not off the table. Yeah, I, I found that when I played doubles the first time, it was a very like railroad experience, like I was just playing by myself. And yeah. not really interacting with my friends. So the borrowing CP is, is pretty low impact. Uh, we did have someone who ended up borrowing, I think, like all of their friends CP, which, <laughs> funny, which is funny. Like, that's a good yeah. story. So yeah. we enjoyed that part. I, I can't recommend that you pre-tell people about our this my secret surprise that we use because it was uh, I don't, you don't want people pre-planning for those kinds of doubles tournaments. Yeah. That sounds like fun. Yeah, yeah I'll yeah. probably do it. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. So you have a 20, 20 to 30 player base, it sounds like, in North Carolina. That's pretty good for, um, yeah. for a three-city three city scene. Yeah, I'm actually surprised when I moved down here a couple of years ago. Uh, I was just like, it was in the middle of a pandemic, and I went to the big store. It's like a, it's like a warehouse space, and most of the like, front of the store is you know, board games and comics and stuff. But the majority of the space is tables, and it was closed off because it was the pandemic, of course. Okay. Um, but I was like, man, when I can come here and play games, it'll be great. A year later, and it was. Which store is this? I don't. I don't... Uh, it's called Atomic Empire, uh, and it's in Durham. Oh, yeah, uh, it's also the origin of my team name on Best Coast Pairing, Citizens of the Empire. Wow, the Atomic Empire. I see. Yeah. Yeah. I assume everyone in your play b- player group is really thankful for you running the living data slate that comes out whenever GW makes a change. Uh, I mean, with all the questions I get, I don't think anyone listens to, looks at it. <laughs> but, you know, I do it basically just for me and the other TOs, really. I will say, as a TO, it is useful to have one big document that everyone can refer back to. And you, you've done... Or more recently, they've added like the asterisk so that you can keep track of when they actually change things, which has been useful. Yeah, I it's 
I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little trade secret here. The living document is the most lazy version of it. Uh, what it can be. Uh, oh my god! There's actually bookmarks. What the heck? For Why? for any for any listeners that don't know, Strom is on the discords and he posts the living document. So every time GW releases a release, he updates this big PDF so that we can have one document with all the changes on. I don't even know if Jason has used it. You know, I haven't. I uh, <laughs> I've kind of been like wrapped up in in a bunch of work and doing less toing lately. But that's definitely a good thing to know about. Yeah, it's one of those things where the people who use it know about it, and the people who don't know about it probably aren't the ones who are going to use it. And I'm okay with that. Uh, and uh, I was going to talk about how I was super lazy and I didn't use bookmarks or anything, but it looks like Adobe fills in bookmarks for some AI reason. AI-generated bookmarks? Yeah. In this economy? It's, it's bad. It's really bad. Don't... <laughs> Don't look at the bookmarks tab, guys. Stay away. And, you know, this data slate came out. You already did the update. Um, are any of your players looking to pick up any of the newly buffed teams? Or is anyone complaining that their favorite teams got nerfed in your in North Carolina? Uh, No, I don't think anyone's complaining because the only nerf, I think, is Chaos Colton. I mean, well, I mean, Marines, Marines got a light tap on the head also. Oh, yeah, Intercession also... got a light tap. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't think anybody who plays Intercession is too upset about it. Uh, but yeah, we've got a, a Warp Coven player who's kind of excited to try the the new rubrics, and another player who's actually excited to start playing Warp Coven because he just finished painting them. Um, man, what were the Warp other... Coven early on in the in the Kill Team edition, right? Yeah, because they were the most complicated, so of course I had to play them. Yeah, for anyone who doesn't know, the new change um, is that the rubrics now have four attacks, which is good because the fourth attack now allows them to reliably kill a seven wound model in melee because they have gargoyle bayonets as an equipment, which were unusable before. So now they have four attacks on threes, four, four, which can reliably dunk seven and eight wound models, which is nice. And then the rubrics now start at three APL and get minus APL if they're not within six inches of one sorcerer. So you can have one sorcerer controlling three rubrics, correct? Yeah, yeah. And and it's a APL modifier, so stun mostly doesn't work on them at that point. Yeah, so yeah, basically Warp Coven have opened up some APL because before a sorcerer could only help one rubric. Now all three rubrics can be held by one sorcerer, so... Yeah. yeah, there's there's a little bit of that, and they can also control points way more efficiently. Now, one assault intercessor does not just beat a rubric, so that's a pretty large buff for the warp coven. It's a pretty significant buff to a, a unit, uh, a model that was really bad. It was a it, rubrics being the slowest model in the game and a two APL marine. It was oof, this is a pretty big change. I think this really really buffs marines, uh, rubric marines a lot. Yeah, I do think that now it looks like the Rubric Marine is a really strong choice compared to the two Dork dork Zangors against places where the Invuln save is going to do good or places where there's a lot more three damage weapons where the two-up save comes up. Granted, it doesn't show up all that often, but maybe Wormblade specifically, I think, has a lot of three damage weapons and Warp Coven yep. you know, could get some buffs there. Speaking of the slowest team in the game, you know, they got a little bit of a... A, a light a light boost the votan now they have a yeah. five inch move instead of a four inch move Ooh. Uh, i and, mean you know they don't decay past four so it was all upside and it is real upside an extra inch of move on the hearthkin does help them on turn one a fair amount it is all upside and as somebody who likes slanesh marines because of the ex one extra inch to their movement characteristic like I probably shouldn't be like, ooh, an extra inch. But also, I start at four, five. I mean, whatever. <laughs> yeah. That's a 25% yeah, increase. Yep, that's true. Yeah, that's true. So they instead of going slow as molasses, they're just slow as sap. I think the biggest winner of this data slate, though, has got to be Exaction. Is there Are there any Exaction players in your area or any people that picked them up, decided they were terrible, and now are like looking at them? Um, there are no exaction players, but there are a number of people who have exaction and are excited to finish them now that they can fight power armor even a little bit, uh, including myself. Yeah. 
Yeah, I've been ha- any reason to finish my exaction squad because I've been low low energy on them. But uh, but no, I I like the changes a lot. I don't think it's quite enough, but I think it it's there. I think it's there. For it, my, I think the the real thing that I'm looking forward to, I think, is exaction squad are the answer to melee summer. Um. Okay. I'll say it's. It might be four subductors on the exaction squad. Five. And then a, well, five shields, right? Yeah. Five shi- Yeah, five shields five with shields. a leader shield and four subductors, and then just five more shotguns backing them up. Could be pretty good. Well, not only that, against cults specifically, who or cults and goats who rely on rerolls a lot, you just don't get rerolls against them. Yeah. It's, 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 it's for it's Lumen true. as a one one EP equipment for anyone who doesn't know that just stops rerolls within four inches of the. Sh- and you put them on the five shields. So now those yeah. shields are just you're just never gonna beat them in melee with any of your any of your dudes with only four attacks. It's just impossible now. Like yeah. on math, as long as you roll average, you will never lose melee against the four four attack model. Yeah, it's it's pretty good. It's hard to shift for something like um cults. It's hard to shift for ravagers. It should be quite the speed bump for Geller Pox. Um, and you know what's uh, really funny? You can actually arrest a mutant, and if they turn into a torment, they stay arrested, <laughs> which is super, super funny. Uh, that's like some Shadowrun stuff. And the best part is, if you if the cult player breaks free of the arresting model and runs up to someone else, uh, they just get rearrested on the charge <laughs> because they the manacles stay on the model; they don't they don't fall off. Oh no! So it's actually I didn't even it's think actually, about that. Yeah, so, you know, for anyone who's really just trying to meme on cults, you could take effectively six manacles, just lock up the devotees and mutants, and as long as you hit the mutants before they turn into torments, teams just uh, just shit out of luck. Oh, yeah, they they don't not get arrested. Oh, yep. man. Yeah, so the, oh, the condition, man. for anyone who doesn't know, obviously this is, like, very, very meme potential, but manacles are an equipment on the exaction squad they say that you start a fight against a model that has seven wounds characteristic or less which is all the mutants all of the devotees and if you fight them and don't die they become arrested arrested models are forced to pass if they're in engagement range of one friendly exaction model so that when you transform from a mutant to a torment the torment still has the arrest buff or debuff which means that anyone can just walk up and hold the torment down and when that model's activation so comes funny. on, they have to pass, which is which is hilarious. I don't think it's good because I think the phosphor lumens and the shields are probably good enough to just dunk. Oh, yeah. Them. But it is a hilarious side effect. And that means that the castigator, the super arrester, has probably got some play there. Fun. Yeah, that's really funny. I might do that just just for the, the shiggles of it. Yeah, I mean, I, you know. You mentioned uh, Geller Pox. That's actually going to be the topic for today's operative showdown because you're a Geller Pox extraordinaire right now. So we just wanted to, you know, between the three non, uh, what Volgar the Thrice Curse, you know, yeah. which one of those mutants has is the is the best mutant? Like your Hulks, your yeah, out of the three Hulks, which one do you go to the most? Which one is the the play Ooh. that? you like the most we're just curious like cool combos and stuff yeah yeah that's a good question um i think they all have their uses so like i think i can say that the tentacle armed one is the least useful and not because of its damage output it can actually have a pretty good damage output but i like it to block movement lanes and funnel opponents into moving in predictable directions because i like following up with a uh, GA2 frag grenade from mutants on it. Um, okay, so I like just throwing it in places, yeah. <clears throat> so I like I like putting the, that tentacle arm mutant just in the way, just so it can be annoying. Um, but, man, I th- think I like the lumber gas the most, just because it, its ability to deal mortals on the charge to a bunch of stuff, and then with its 6-7 brutal attack, just like fight twice, kill two things in one hit, because you know, screw you, I do you seven to uh, ten damage. Oh, it's, the, it's the, big, the big, the big uh, so, cleaver guy, right? The, 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 the Lumbergast is the one with the fly arm and the big, like, spoon spike as his other arm. 
Whoa, so okay. uh, when you finish it, it has a special charge action called Spike Charge. And whenever you finish it, all enemies in, in, in its engagement range take D3 mortal wounds, which is great. And its base melee weapon does 6-7 damage. And it's brutal, which means that only normal yeah. attacks can parry it. Yeah, which only crits is, can parry it. Which is quite good. Yeah, so any anything with seven wounds, it just dies. If I hit once, which you pop Blessings of Infection, which means that if you, on four dice, if the numerical result of all misses is three or more, so if you roll all ones, you retain a miss as a hit. So against seven wounds, you're dealing a minimum of seven damage no matter what on the charge. So just so a he disaster. Just, he, he just kills seven wound models without rolling dice. It's great. Yeah, that's pretty gross. And he's pretty likely to kill eight wound models without really rolling dice. Yeah, that's I hadn't really thought about the lumber gas that way, but it, that's that is what he does. He just, so you're saying so your lumber gas is your you're like VIP out of the three three hulks. Yeah, he's the one that usually does a bunch of melee damage. Uh, he's the one who racks up that uh that score fifty wounds with Hulk's thing for the most part. Mm. Yeah, does yeah, the spike my... charge? Count? Yes. Yeah, it's all damage in engagement range, not from combats. Um, as uh, I'm pretty sure. Let me double check, but I'm pretty oh, sure that's right, how that works. Right. That's how that works. It's okay. So for anyone who doesn't know, Rampant Nightmare is one of Gellerpox's tack ops. If you do 30 damage with Nightmare Hulks within engagement range, which are the four large Hulks, uh, you get one point. If you do 50, you get another point. So the lumber gas, when it does the belly bump, you have to be in engagement range, so it does count. So if you belly bump like three dudes, it's like a third of the way to getting a point. Sometimes. It's, yeah, it's it's pretty funny. Like you you look at the card and go, how am I going to do 30 damage with four models? And at the end of the game, you're like, oh, these four models did actually uh, almost 100 to the entire enemy team. Right. That's how they, gener- that. they generally do, like, all the work, right? Like, yeah, the majority do- of the work is coming from four models on this team. Yeah, they- Except not on Into the Dark. On Into the Dark, the majority of your work will be done by Sludge Grubs and uh, Mutant Frag Grenades, just because Sludge Grubs and Frag Grenades are all lethal five up because of Blast and Splash. Mm-hmm. And I find that in Into the Dark, Hulks are there to just wall off space in their possible charge range. So like, yeah, Hulks are going to wreck your face if you let them charge you. And here is their charge range. So don't come near me. So let me score points over here. Thanks very much. <laughs> so, OK, so the lumber gas is your go to on in general, it sounds like. Yeah, in general, so he's, the, for, he's the guy for the equipment for Gellerpox, because there's so many choices. You know, you got the sludge grub, the ice yeah. finger swarm, the curse might, you know, which one of those are your go to's? in you know out of the equipment because there's so many choices there's so many like splits do you have a split that you do the most and like why or you know um it depends i don't really have a split that i do the most i mean on into the dark it's three sludge grubs and probably a fly if stun is useful uh or a flea if i just really need to mop something up Mm -hmm. otherwise in open boards sludge grubs are mostly useless because they're too slow um, but that's where like three flies and a flea is good if you really need to stun a lot or three fleas and a fly if you want to uh, clear like, clear things off the board later on. Like fleas are excellent into ravagers because if they have any amount of damage on them, fleas mm-hmm. go from two attacks hitting on fours to three attacks hitting on fours, lethal five up. So like they, they can get crits or they might go from three attacks to four attacks, but like they go, yeah. they're much better at generating crits. And that, you know, if you jump in to f- kill frenzy, to kill off a frenzied goat with one of your equipment models, that's <laughs> yeah, probably, that's I'm aware. yeah, you're great. Like if it dies, you know, you're, you're fine with that. So for, you know, players who don't know Geller Pox, they have this unique mechanic where they don't take equipment. They have three different extra operatives, basically that they can take the curse might is the flea model and they're good at, finishing up wounded models the st- eye stinger swarm are annoying mosquitoes so they stun models and then the sludge grubs are slow things that spit acid basically yeah. as far as like weapons go the sludge grub gun isn't bad it's just four inch movement while the other two are six inches and fly and on a team with 15 models 
Do you need things to be not in the way? On open mm. board, it's a lot easier to move around with the curse mites and eye stinger swarms. And the team does have already a lot of four movement models. So having, yeah, yeah on open, it can cause traffic jams or, you know, you might get a blast that you don't want because this model is stuck. Yep. Yeah. So, All right. It, Killer Pox is a tough team. They are strong, but movement is their weakest area. And so if you're confident in your ability to position and move in the correct activation order, then the team can fall apart very quickly. Yeah, speaking of movement, they do have, you know, one ploy that is quite good. Do you find that you'd use Drawn to the Hum every turn? Oh, no. Wow, that would get depressingly expensive so quickly. Well, before <sighs> before the before the buff or before the nerf, did you use Drawn to the Hum very often? Uh, for, um, you know, for listeners who don't know, Drawn to the Hum is all the Geller Pox can make a dash to an objective if they're within six inches of it. But it gets yeah. more expensive every time you use it. Yeah, Drone with Hum is very good. Um, the nerf in question for the listeners is not Drone to the Hum is 1+. That has always been 1+. It just came out oh. of the box like that. The nerf is Volgar used to be able to generate you a command point every turn as long as he was on a different objective at the start of the strategic play phase, which I was usually pretty good at getting three command points a game. Like that was my my average, uh, which truly you know what? disgusting. Truly disgusting. Totally worth like good nerf. He can only do it once. I'm okay with that. Um, but I only ever use drawn to the hum once a game usually, and it's either turn one to get a glitchling up onto a point, um, or it's turn two. So I can get a Hulk out if I win initiative for a aggressive charge or an important charge. Makes sense. Okay, yeah. I mean, that's that's a lot of good Geller Pox knowledge. I think you know, I personally I find the or actually so you know just for a counterpoint, I saw the Bloat Spawn do some crazy work at the New Mexico Finals, where Orion used. I think the Bloat Spawn basically ended up taking down five models of aces hunter clade in the final game oh yeah where, i've where I've had the know, bloat spawn go off like that too yeah. he's great at doing that yeah so for players you know who don't know the bloat spawn he's got a three inch range tentacle bolter with six attacks instead of four so orion started by rolling really well and just nuking a hunter clade 10 wound model above him on a piece of vantage and then he charged someone else and then pass. So charging and passing was a really big thing for the bloat spawn. So afterwards, Ace had, I think, three models in engagement range. So they were all stuck. So he decided to fight the bloat spawn instead of falling back because he tried to fall back, I think, with one model. It got stuck because the bloat spawn has tentacles, so it can stop you from running away. And then after the failed runaway, Ace decided to start attacking it. And then it just it just wailed on, I think, like three different I think two Skatari and a Sicarian and just deleted them all. Oh, yeah. Again, like, it only does three, four damage in melee, but it has six attacks. Correct. So, like, it doesn't matter what you throw at it. It has more attacks than you do. Yeah. And you're probably going to be injured because there's no Hulk going to be in melee range or something that doesn't make you injured. So he's going to hit more than you do. He's going to have uh, the ability to parry you off with his five up feel no pain. Like, he can just put out damage and just not take damage. That's why I love the bloat spawn for his ability to just be in a place and make that the most annoying place he could be right at that moment. Yeah, he can like barge through everybody to just like run into a big chunk and trap them like that. I think that's like my favorite Geller Pox play in the whole book is just like is that maneuver where he just like traps somebody and it just turns into a huge problem that like the opponent was not at all planning to to have to deal with. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, so you mentioned earlier that you are the primary melee player in your local scene. So there's no one else, you know, no other heroes that come up to face the melee that have decided to pick up the sword. They're, they all stick to their ranged range teams. Uh, I mean, some players are playing like Hunter Clade or we've got one blooded player. They're not really melee, but they're more combined arms. 
Anyone who thinks Blooded is a melee team is wrong. It's a combined arms team. But like they have a handful of melee models, but yeah, I think most teams are not. There's not a ton of like all melee until now, right? Gellerpox, yeah. Felgor, and Colts are the true melee teams, and they feel like it because they they really don't have a ton of long range options. No, no, they don't. Um, but no, we have one player who is building goats and has a couple of games in with them. I actually played him uh, with my Gellerpox. Uh, it didn't go so well for the Ravagers. Um, mm, but interesting. Yeah, I, I think a couple of people have cults and are thinking about building them. Um, but we have probably the most conscientious, conscientious, nice area, nice group of people to play in who look at a team like Chaos Cults and go, you know what, I don't even want to deal with that. I'm just going to play another team that I like who isn't busted. So you've got a ton of nice players in the North Carolina scene. Who's the nicest of the nice? Oh, uh, hmm. Well, by popular vote, this, this uh, gentleman named Zach, he plays Hyrotech Circle, and he won uh, Best Sportsman at the last tournament. And I have a hard time disagreeing with that, but, like, man, everybody is just so chill and good to talk to and have a good time. Like I have a guy named Andy who plays Novitiates. He's picking up the Hearthkin Salvagers. Uh, and he's always a blast to talk to, a blast to play against. Um, he was demolishing me in one of my first games as Star Striders. And like he just ran a clinic on me. And I had one of the best games I've ever played just because the interaction with him. He's such a nice guy. Yeah, I mean, you know, locally, we just had a player step up to help pay for a kid's entry fee to one of our tournaments. And he's also a higher tech player, Calvin, if he's listening, you know. So maybe the higher tech players have it. They're the best sportsmen, huh? Yeah. You know, I would, uh, un- totally unbiased, I would agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> are you are you playing higher tech right now, George? Is that is there like some sneaky ranged team that you're hiding in the melee pile? Uh, I mean... So, uh, for full disclosure, they're the only teams I don't own are Hearthkin Salvagers and Kazerkin. And the only teams I haven't played are those two, Exaction and Inquisition. Wow. I think that's correct. Uh, that, that is a pretty widespread. So, when people ask you questions, that's why you're the TO. You know all the answers, right? I mean, I pretend like I know all the answers, and since I'm the TO, they have no choice but to listen to me. <laughs> that's, that's, that's that's an abuse of power george we're gonna we're gonna have the red card you on the we're gonna have the red card uh, you right now yeah red card the to <laughs> uh i mean i know a lot of the rules i don't pretend to know all of them but i do know where i can look them up if i do need do if i don't know off the top of my head that's a, that's a that's a good that's a good thing any other hometown heroes you want to give a call out to um yeah so I got two. Um, most recently, the Atomic Empire store, they run like a monthly or bi-monthly learn to play day. And so uh, one of our guys went over and he taught two two dudes, two new people, how to play Kill Team. But instead of doing it in the most reasonable way you'd expect by having them play together, he instead played both of them at the same time. Oh, like two whole separate games. Two whole separate games at once. Impressive. It, it kind of, I don't think it was the most efficient use of his time, but also he is a hero and he got both people to come back and play more kill team. So he did his job. Uh, and the second one is, uh, oh, uh, his name is Joe Gallo. He's a great guy. Uh, and the second one is um, by... Uh, partner in crime, Mr. Mark French, who runs the leagues at Atomic Empire. Um, nice. He does quarterly leagues. We have a bunch of data. Like He's got a bunch of data on uh, team usage, team win rates, win rates on specific maps, on specific layouts, on specific missions. Like We, we keep track of a whole bunch of uh, data for the local area. Um, and he just he runs the entire thing. He built all that data tracking stuff all on his own. Um, he set up a whole form and everything for us to use, and he's just the best. We would not have the community that we do without him. Bravo. 
for sure that sounds that sounds like a lot of hard work i have done that you know i've done that a little bit with one of my narrative campaigns and i decided to not do it because <laughs> it was just like it was just too much for me i was like i'm it's juggling so much work things. yeah, yeah it's so, so much bravo. work and he's absolute hero yeah for sure he is a hero so with that data do you know how your meta looks compared to the proposed discord meta or you know what all the other tier lists look like do you feel like are that do they feel different i'm just curious because you have the information i do if i was a smarter man i would have uh that information readily to hand but instead i will have to search for it so just give me a moment because discord is pretty good about this sort of stuff yeah, is there anything that jumps straight out as, like, you've seen some, like, internet hot takes, then you just know off the top of your head that you're getting wildly different results locally? Um, maybe on some of the teams. So, let's see, teams, uh, we have a 100% win rate on a couple of teams, but they've only been played once. Like, Kazakin have a 100% win rate, they have one game logged. So like our data is, you know, sub ten games for a lot of stuff. You heard it here first, folks. Casterkin, one hundred percent win rate. Op. <laughs> Quick, give the nerf bat. Um, but for the most part, it bears out. A lot of the outliers are stuff you'd expect. Um, Legionnaire high up there. Geller Pox high up there. Um, <clears throat> uh, stuff with a lot of games. But there's also a lot of stuff that. Most of the teams are in the 50% win rate uh, range, 55, 45 to 55. There's very few that are under it. And like intercession in our, in our local meta has a 30% win rate overall. Uh, so like, that's, and that's I think, pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah. I think it's because a lot of the intercession players are newer to the game. And so they're playing a lot of more experienced people who are playing other more, uh, cerebral teams. Um, yeah. It's like so. the experience gap definitely matters. And as intercession has been getting nerfed over time, I feel like that the gap is probably much bigger than it was on intercession release. Because I, I remember when intercession first came out, they did feel very strong and a new player had a sporting chance. It felt like, you know, back when legionary also had, a damage mitigation nerf on normal damage that happened consistently those things did happen a lot more where like a new player could just tank more damage than most players were ready for yeah yeah i agree um but like um we have data on all the archetypes that people choose uh <laughs> so we have 100 games seek and destroy 80 games recon 70 security only 20 in infiltration but that's a lot because a lot of teams can't take infiltration like, yep and most people don't play those teams, I can. Um, but the data bears out to recon far and away the best uh, um, overall the best secondary pick. Nowadays, yeah, after they have, crit ops. Yeah, they have the most uh, wins, win percentage overall. Uh, seek and destroy and security are within 0.3% of each other, 0.4% of each other. So they're pretty average in our local meta which i think bears out security and seek and destroy are mostly the same from my experience playing them and then infiltration is by far and away the worst at 33 percent overall in our local meta but a lot of people again aren't are either using it for the first time ever uh or are me because i'm like the only other guy who uses teams with infiltration and i'll pick them over the other stuff because I like him. I like Infiltrate. I think it's fun. Yeah, I mean, as far as one of the niche tactics for this week goes, I actually think that Infiltration is quite good on Chaos Cults. I yeah. suspect that post-nerf, it'll still be good. Being able to have the Torments score actively on secondaries is really, really rough. And the good thing about Infiltration, for players who don't know, is a lot of the secondaries don't really give your opponent a lot of reaction so one of the things that was made really apparent when the new crit ops deck came out is that reacting to your opponent's tack ops is way more important so for example seek and destroy if someone takes eliminate guards you know you should start positioning your models to not be on the points as much as possible 
So and eliminate guards is sneaky hard to score because it you can only choose guards on the center line or in your opponent's territory, and there are some layouts that just like that's three instead of four. I mean, there's mm-hmm. a one layout where that's five instead of four, yeah. but it can be tough to do. And, you know, the good thing about infiltration, they have subversive control. So on turns three and four, if you control one of your opponent's objectives, you get a point. So yeah. this incentivizes you to use a torment to run over to your opponent's side and fight on your opponent's side on their objectives. And all of those things are things you already wanted to do. So I believe at ACO, I saw most players playing Seek and Destroy. I think that there's definitely some play on infiltration just because the attack ops are so much more in line with stopping your opponent from controlling what you can do while also scoring points which is... yeah and like when i've been looking at infiltration like a lot of them it looks like it would do better with the horde team where like if you um there's like the one that you it's like gather recon or whatever i forgot what it's called but you just like run out there and like park park somebody just hiding away from everybody like if you're an elite team you can't really do that because you run out there and then your opponent has like nine more activations and they can just run up and tag you but with a horde team you can just have your last person run out there and score that point and your opponent can't out activate you to to have an answer for that gather surveillance i think infiltration is far and away the best archetype for cults like far and away no contest yeah okay at seek and destroy they're they're they start bad at seek and destroy until they get some torments and then they're only kind of okay because you're really telegraphing where you want that seek and destroy stuff to happen and seek and destroy is sneaky hard to do like headhunter if they don't give you their their leader that can be really hard to max robin ransack is not super hard to max but also they could just run away from your torments until you get it super late in the game Eliminate Guard, again, on stuff like loot is fine, but Capture is really bad. Um, So, like, I think Infiltration, which lets you get your entire team involved to do the good, the good Infiltration Tech Ops, because, was it, Plant Beacon is terrible, don't ever choose it. So Implant and Subversive Control are both great, and then Gather Surveillance, because you have 15 models, there might be a spot on the map where you can hide a guy in your opponent's uh, territory without him being shot at for a turn basically you nominate a person to gather intelligence they sit there on conceal and do nothing which is sometimes what you want to do anyways and that means that your mutants and your torments can all do objectives which they can't do very efficiently normally which yeah. is nice yeah so. i think gather surveillance with the faction tech ops available is or, uh infiltration archetype with the faction tech ops available is great yeah, that's solid. I hadn't thought of that. I mean, not that we need any more buffs to the chaos cults. Speaking but, of which, you know, as far as like niches go, I suspect people want to find niches against the the melee summer that's incoming. And I know we already yeah. talked about Exaction Squad, but maybe Jason or Strom, you guys have some ideas. Yeah, like looking for some some keys to to unlock a better game against. Uh, if someone's getting wrecked by Chaos Cults or, or Felgorn or looking for some cool tips or anything, um, got any insight there? Uh, play Void Dancers. <laughs> yeah. um, but besides the buy a new team and play another bus, but kind of busted team, um, it, it's all really kind of how you position and the threats your threat saturation for both of those teams. Um, Cause like they're not particularly tough models individually up until you get to torments and chaos cult. They're, they're, they're a nightmare, but up until you get to torments, even seven wound mutants, like yeah, five of field no pain kind of sucks. It's kind of annoying when they spike, but they can also just not do anything either. And so if you're, opponent your chaos cultist opponent is particularly unlucky and lets you kill all of their mutants before they can torment you've just killed all of their torments uh and so there's definitely play it's all about uh, against chaos cultists it's kill the mutants as soon as you can focus on the devotees after that if you can get a shot off on a dark kami model sure take it but like they're kind of not that important in the grand scheme of the team uh and then on felgors i mean you got to shoot them to frenzy them, and then maybe you can take them out in melee. I don't know. Felgor is much tougher. It's... I think Felgor, in my experience, the winning line that I've had is 
you can, if you kill the psyker, so there's no healing, that helps a lot. So that's like the f- very important model. If you can frenzy the psyker as soon as possible, that buys you a lot of time because then you can start chipping away at Felgor rather than trying to let them come into melee at 100% health. Because ideally, you do a little bit of chip damage. If the psyker is dead, then if they come into melee, they could actually die when they fight you. If they're doing the charge and pass stuff where they don't fight you, then you do need to be much more proactive about shooting. And yeah, that is a little bit miserable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I the only times I've played against Felgor, I played Gellerpox and I played Chaos Cult. And so my experience playing uh, in the two games of Felgor I have played, which was against Legionary and Breacher, and the two games against them I've played, is that if Felgor can bully you off of points, it's going to be a bad time for you. But if you can't get bullied off those points, it's going to be a bad time for the Ravagers. And I don't really know what to do about that other than, like, did you did you bring a tough enough team that Ravagers can't bully you? Like, I, it feels bad that Ravagers kind of feel like a, uh, almost like a team check. Like, did you bring the right team for this matchup? No, uh, I guess you lose. Yeah, I mean, for teams that have access to stun grenades, if the if you expect that the Ravager player is going to be a charge pass recon Ravager player where they never start a fight action because they they always want to frenzy on your turn, then stun grenades actually provide some value because there's a lot of clumping on objectives. And if you drop a stun and you hit four goats, you can't control anything, right? It's true, but so, they have war paint. War paint doesn't disallows negative APL modifiers. Oh, does it? Yeah. Know. Yeah, yeah. Well, so stun doesn't really work on them either. War paint is stupid. War paint yeah. is too good for one. For sure. Me- I remember when I read the team, I was like, this this recruitment is a lot. Too good. Uh, it would be kind of bad at three. I think two is fine. But one, it's way too strong. One with a limit, I'd be okay with also. But yeah, yeah. one with a limit of two or three, sure. Or even like a limit of five. That's fine. Like, let, let half the team smear war paint and then give them a couple other things. I think that would have been fine. But yeah, they're a little bit strong right now. For any players who don't know, one of the very common uh, meta ways to play Felgor Ravagers, which is powerful, but uh, seemingly not very fun to play as, is you just never initiate a fight action. Because if you f- ever initiate a fight action and you risk the chance that your opponent's commando kills you in melee, then you lose your special rule, which is frenzy. So you can play recon and you can play this very positional game where you just dump goats on top of points and just steal points from your opponents and egg your opponent into fighting you, which can be very hard to deal with. So on open, shoot them as early as possible. On in the dark, it's not a, there's not a lot that you can do right now. Be Void Dancers or Gather Box or Chaos Cults. Yeah. is the answer yeah. there oh actually so what other teams do you think have a good chance in melee summer right now i talked about exaction squad i think maybe you might mention hunter clade or i hunter i think hunter should clade, be fine i think hunter because, clade have some play and then yeah. void dancers is there anyone else like in your short list um and why me, i guess yeah give me there's this there's so many teams i have to go through uh i think legionary is still fine um, they're they're durable enough, um, and they have enough lethal five up on the team to handle uh, like all the things. I think they can put up a fight against Keller Pox. Um, so I think Legionary is still in in the clear. Uh, I think Phobos are good and open and suffer a lot on Into the Dark. Uh, I also think the same thing of Hand of the Archon. I think they can really put up a lot of results on open and they will struggle mightily and into the dark just because they can just be crits for days and that's kind of hands thing just crits for days yeah hand of the archon is an interesting one because once they're on in the dark they struggle to open doors efficiently (laughs) yeah it's one of those things like hand of the archon's whole gimmick is their power from pain which gives them rerolls and plus one apl uh, and I use the dash on the kill sometimes, but honestly, I, I mostly save them for plus one APL and rerolls because the team doesn't have good access to rerolls until you get pain tokens. And so Into the Dark stymies them because when you need the plus one APL, which is for doors, by the time you're getting them, all the doors are open. 
Yeah, that's definitely super true. I do have to say Phobos on Into the Dark has been super gnarly and I've been having a lot of fun with it. Um, I've just been running pure and cursors like I'll bring warriors and everything. <laughs> and then you just like you pop smoke on a door, you open the door. It's a one way shooting mirror. That's just a nightmare for everyone. Like the number one thing that keeps you safe on Into the Dark is obscuring. And if there's six space marines that ignore that, that's a nightmare. And then just you... like crazy aisles and like hallways and stuff where you, it's just like, oh, hey, you, there's your little like important dude back there. Pop. Here's a Nerf gun bullet, which is eventually going to kill you. You are the reason that my parents said, careful, there are there are mean people in the outside <laughs> world. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. There. <laughs> yeah. Six and Cursors has been just the craziest thing. I mean, it's just like super, super alpha strike like no one would expect. And then like also on open boards. Like, if there's a big, like, heavy piece of terrain in the middle of the board, and you put your incursor on top, and then you can still see someone, even though there's an obscuring piece of terrain in the middle of the board, this is now just a one-way shooting mirror against, like, the whole map. And then you put, like, three incursors up there, and then you're like, welcome to the Alpha Strike, boys. Like, let's get it. Uh, but yeah. then as soon as they start hitting back, you just buckle and die. So you just have to <laughs> super-duper <laughs> Alpha Strike someone and just kill, like, half their team on turn one. And uh, it's pretty fun, honestly. Yeah, I had that happen to me. Uh, my very first game with Chaos Cult was against a good player who was like two or three games into Phobos. And he had such a good turn one that I told him, it feels like I'm playing against 12 wound, three up save Void Dancers. Like he just, he was <laughs> up in my stuff. He was he using a bunch of Reavers? He had two Reavers, a couple of Incursors. Like he was just up in my stuff, turn one. He killed like six dudes right off the rip i was like what do i how do i come back from this but it was uh, you know it was chaos cult so i i did eventually come back to <laughs> two point win but man well, I, was... we were giving our we were giving our listeners so much hope for a second so <laughs> you just took it away from him he made a couple of mistakes trying to fight torments but uh it, it was a super close game that could have went either way uh but i did get a couple of spikes on my feel no pain so like it eventually he just ran out of gas and on an elite team when you run out of gas that's it you're out. That's like the truest thing I've ever heard about Phobos. Like every single game no matter who you're up against though, it's just like turbo alpha strike and then you've run out of gas. <laughs> I mean, you have to do all this work with bolters. How do I do all this work with bolters? Yeah, I think if I was stuck against on open with Colts, I would have taken probably like four reavers. To do the uh, graph shoot charge on turn one, because you they still have to get points on turn one, or you know, die. And yeah, then with like think... the terror tactics and everything, you can just like yoink people's objectives. Yeah, I mean, the, you get on open on the short deployments. You know, you have effectively like thirteen inches of threat range on turn one, which is pretty potent, especially because yeah. you you fly when you. It's do. like I mean, it's like the... thirteen point nine because of the charge. Yeah. Yeah. The the easy um counter to that is just don't move up your mutants so when you start turn two with two torments and just multi-charge a bunch of reavers uh i think actually just going six and cursors on open against cults is the way to go just like i'm gonna shoot you and i don't care where i'm standing yeah i mean they're gonna be on conceal but on open at least you can flip some of the orders which is super just give super them all important grapnel, yeah you give them all grapnel guns get up on vantage real early and then with the nerf to the icon arc now, especially bolters hurt seven wound five up save models. They do, and so you just you know, like take yeah, them out. Yeah, honestly, that's the whole reason that I still like vote for pure incursors because then it's like that plus no cover, and like ignore obscuring makes it really really easy to get shots that the enemy is not expecting. Yeah, and as long as you're not playing capture, they'll have to think twice. If you kill a bunch of devotees. And they'll have to think twice. Oh, man, I guess I'll have a couple of Dark Commune and models that can't do mission actions. Like, what do I do? Do I actually get torments out? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, th I think incursors are the way against Chaos Cult, just because like you just need to you need to kill two models at with most of your team on turn one with every single Phobos. It's it's a rough matchup. But if you can do that, like cult just. <clears throat> excuse me cults just they sort of crumble at that point yeah they've definitely got an inverse power curve where they're really weak on turn one and they're really strong on turn four so if you can do a lot of work on the early turns you can get away with a lot more 
it really is just like the exact opposite of Phobos. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think Phobos have a really good matchup into Chaos Cult I for agree. that reason. So hopefully, if any listeners are playing Exaction Squad and they really want to try cults and see how good these niche tactics are, love to hear about it on the Discord. And if anyone from any of the other local communities, I see you in uh, Sydney, South Wales, New Wales. I don't somewhere in Australia. I see you listeners on on the metrics. Come by our Discord and tell us about all of these games post buff and post nerf. And George, are there any final callouts you wanted to give to anyone in the triangle, not the triad? Not the triad. Um, uh, no, I think we've covered the triangle, but North Carolina is a big state. Um, there is another group of people, uh, another team spinning up in Asheville, North Carolina, uh, which is like three hours ish uh, east of me. Uh, and they're they're starting out. I went to a tournament uh, there. I took Chaos Cults to that tournament and came in first because I'm a terrible, horrible human being. Uh, and in my defense, it was just because I wanted to get more games with Cult in for Nova. Because uh, <laughs> you're, you're expecting to get a Nova with Cults too, then. I was expecting Gellerpox to get nerfed and they weren't touched at all. And so uh, I guess I'm going back to my babies. Uh, but yeah, so uh, shout out to David and that whole uh, that whole scene. If anyone is in or near Asheville, North Carolina, uh, check them out. They have a Discord. Um, they also meet up at the deck box frequently. Um, and uh, I'm going to shout out myself. Go watch my YouTube channel. It's Strong Plays Kill Team. Uh, I will have another video up eventually, I promise. Listen, I have a, a real job and it works me a lot, but I'm doing my best. And you have a tournament coming up soon, right? You give it one more shout out before we head out. Yeah, I've got two actually. I'm running another a tournament at a local game bar. Uh, 16 players, four rounds on um, the 23rd. And then I'm running a doubles tournament on September 30th at Atomic Empire. Uh, and yeah, it's going to be busy kill team. I'm excited. I'm excited just for so many people to play this game. I think it's such a good game. Righty. Sounds great. Thanks for uh, coming, listeners. We're hoping to hear from anyone who shows up to the Discord. What's the keyword this week, Jason? Oh, the keyword this week. Uh, How about Cassiopeia? Cassiopeia. That sounds great. Yeah, Cassiopeia. Spell that the, one, guys. <laughs> to the two listeners that showed up and said pancakes, it was great to have you in the Discord. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank you for having me. Yes, thanks for coming.